Every year, tens of thousands of dogs, mostly beagles, are used as tools in deadly research experiments. Join me, your host, Ellie Hansen, as we dive into this issue and talk to all the awesome people out there trying to make a difference for these dogs. Best of all, find out what you can do to help. We're opening doors for discussion and shedding light on the facts. This is Dog Research Exposed. Is there an art to living with a dog? It certainly does take some aptitude, a certain degree of knowledge depending on the situation, and often, yes, creativity. As I was preparing to record this podcast episode, I thought, is there an art to living with a former laboratory research dog? In rehabilitating my own former research dogs, I had pieced together advice from a few dog trainers and painted a pathway to their healing using my own heart and intuition. It wasn't easy, but it worked for us, my dogs and I. When I first met Tamara, I knew she would be the perfect person to answer this question. What is the art to living with a former laboratory research dog? First, because she has adopted two laboratory dogs herself. And second, because she believes in seeing the world through a dog's eyes, something that not all dog trainers do. Tamaro Takash is the owner and head trainer at Courteous Canines, which she founded over 30 years ago. While her expertise is in canine behavior, nutrition, and obedience, it's also so much more. As Tamara says so eloquently, we must embrace the sacred contract that we have with our dogs. They are the souls that come to change our lives forever. Join us as we take a deep look into helping former research dogs find happiness in this insightful episode of Dog Research Exposed. Sammy was your first laboratory research beagle. How did you find out about Sammy, and what condition was he in when you adopted him? So it was one of those situations where a colleague of mine was a co-director of a beagle rescue, or actually at the time it was Cascade Beagle Rescue. Uh, my my um, my Labrador Retriever Chloe had passed away. She was fourteen. And uh, several months later, I reached out to this woman, Patty, and uh, she was at Cascade. And I said, I'm looking for a beagle. She showed me a couple of her beagles that were available. And I scheduled a time to go. And she said, you know, I know you're coming up, but um, I'd like you to look at this lab beagle. And I said, oh, my gosh. I said, what a combination, lab and beagle. And she said, oh, no, no. Um, It's a laboratory former laboratory research beagle. And I just, I, I got physically ill. I, I couldn't believe that being in the dog business for so many decades, I thought I had heard and was familiar with so many different niches and what have you. And she said, yeah, it's a, these, I have six dogs. Um, it's the first six that are legally released in New Jersey through a research facility. And I think you'd be a perfect match because they really need a special person and you have a background in behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So long story short, I, I went there and uh, I did meet the first dog, but it just, it wasn't the right match. And I said, let's, let's meet this dog. And I met him and uh, the laboratory research dog and it was love at first sight. I mean, I know it sounds kind of corny, but he just was magnificent in so many ways. And I was awestruck that this dog had only been out of the lab for, I think at the time, five days. And he was just so endearing and connect. we connected. And then that's how I got him. I, I brought my son back with my husband a couple of days later. And I was really, really impressed by, for a dog that had been shut off from the world for six and a half years 
had never touched grass, had never gone up and down stairs, had never seen anything other than the four walls and the confines of a sterile laboratory. He, my, our son at the time was five. He frolicked and, and trailed our son for a good 30 minutes outside this, this woman's um, house in her back, fenced in backyard. And so that was it. So that's how I came to discover this horrible, heart-wrenching situation of laboratory dogs. But at the same token, I just felt as if he came into my life for a reason, because I believe every animal comes into your life for a reason. And I just wanted to make sure that for all the years he gave in the lab, that he was afforded that many more years tacked on to his life. You know, on, ironically, in the in the end, Ellie, that is what happened. He he lived to be eighteen, so he was given t- almost twelve years here with a very loving, relaxing, happy, healthy life. He was in excellent condition. I will say, I know that not all of these dogs are in excellent condition. A lot of them are malnourished. They're their dentition is terrible. Of course, their constitution is broken and, and all of that. And the list goes on and on and it's, and it's terrible. But I can only speak for Sammy and I have, a, I have another laboratory research dog, uh, a second adopted one now. I can only speak for them and the ones that I have worked with as a professional. But Sammy, he had great muscle tone. His dentition was terrific, but he was he was really scared and rightfully so. And so I just worked at his pace and I didn't want to give him too much too soon because that's just how I operate in general with clients, dogs, and my dogs. But I, I also, I immediately recognized that he had a very unusual sense of curiosity considering he had been in a cage in a laboratory for all those years. So I, I really, I tried to capitalize on that. I saw that while he was cautious, he was cautiously curious. So I, I took his lead. I I know there are a lot of trainers and dog people out there that say, you know, you have to be alpha. And I don't think that way. I, I don't like that mentality. It's too dominating. I don't, it's not a competition here. It's okay. There's two hearts beating next to each other. How can we really make this relationship work and have a synergistic relationship. And so I just took his lead. I was not trying to control any of the situations when it came to learning. I controlled situations if they were stressful for him. So you already had decades of experience as a dog training professional and expertise in animal nutrition at the time you adopted Sammy. But what did Sammy teach you that was different? I really embraced his curiosity because I think so many times people go into having a dog and they think, okay, I need to teach this dog to sit, to lie down, to come when called, to X, Y, and Z. And I took it from a different standpoint. I took it from, okay... I'm going to see what he's curious about and build on that. And by doing so, what I found was his curiosity, as long as it was a safe environment for him to be in, him exploring whatever it was, it might've been grass. It may have been a bag of groceries, whatever it was, it was, as long as it was a positive experience, it boosted his confidence. And if you're boosting one's confidence, you're reducing or at least diminishing the stress. And even if you take a a bigger step back and you look at that, if you're, if you're reducing the stress and increasing the confidence with that, the ancillary impact is you're increasing happiness, right? And if you're increasing happiness, the body and the mind and the emotions on a, on a quantum physics level, without getting all scientifically deep here it helps to, it helps the body heal from trauma. The other side of it though, is the body, right? Because these dogs are given subpar food. The taxing day in and day out of just being in a lab takes a toll on the emotions and then therefore on the body. 
And because I also specialize in canine nutrition, I, I always tell people use 10 days. If you're going to transition a dog from one diet to another, use 10 days. And I don't recommend this, that people do this, but I'm just, I'm being transparent just to tell you what I did with Sammy because I assessed his situation. And I said, you know what, this dog is in good condition. He's healthy. He's very food motivated. I mean, what Beagle is not food motivated for the most part. Right. And so he came home and I just fed him. I started him on raw food the day he came home and it was slowly, you know, I didn't just immediately trans transition him on day one, but I, on day one, I gave him a teaspoon of raw food. And then day two, I gave him two teaspoons of raw food. And that in and of itself was giving his body what it needed because every dog's an individual. So you have to really assess each individual dog and then your willingness and, and what your comfort level is and build some kind of a plan and work from there. As you mentioned, Sammy passed away at the golden age of 18. Honestly, not many dogs get to live that long, but Sammy lived a quality life for that long. So what were your secrets to helping him live such a long, happy life, especially considering where he came from? I'm, I'm a huge advocate for a biologically correct, appropriate raw food diet. But that's not for every person. That might not be for every dog. You have to do what's best for your dog and, and what you're also comfortable with. But if I if I had to sum up what other things really contributed to his happiness and his good quality of life, free will, I you know, the the, the best way to sum that up is I'd let him be a dog. The way I work with people is I, I, I do in-home private behavior and, and nutrition, right? And so what I find a lot of times when I go in to someone's home is there, even though these are not laboratory research dogs, a lot of dogs are suppressed. Every natural canine behavior is typically suppressed. The people are saying, no, stop. You can't sniff that. No, don't do that. Um, don't bark, stop barking, be quiet. And the list goes on and on. So having and allowing a dog to be a dog, and that includes, you know, let them dig, you know, it might be, you create a little dig spot on your property or you bring them for a hike and you let them dig there. Um, you can bury little toys and treasures in your property in a dig spot. If you'd like to do that, some dogs aren't diggers. So then that's not, that's not for them, but the basic behavior of sniffing is such a stress buster. And then you factor in, you've got a scent hound here that is able to deduce and to decode so many different scent particles that it's so overlooked of just how do you de-stress a dog? One of the ways is you, you let them sniff, you let them do dog things. You have to know your dog and that, that comes with time. It's impossible for anyone, no matter where the dog comes from, to just get a dog and say, okay, I, I understand. I know this dog. It's a Doberman. It's a Labrador. It's a Beagle. This is what they're like. You can't base it on breed or you can't base it on where they came from. You have to base it off of that particular living being. So free will, a lot of sniffing. It's a dopamine release when they sniff. So that's another good thing. And I, I think the final point on that, Ellie, is so many dogs don't have a purpose. They don't feel as if they're needed. It's for any being. If, if you have a sense of purpose, you have a reason to get up and get through your day. And there's enrichment that's involved with that, right? And so then that enrichment carries over to cognition, which carries over to neuroplasticity, which is, you know, you're, you're essentially basically able to learn new things. My overarching belief system with, um, in particularly with Sammy is I assumed competence. I just, I looked at him on that day at the rescue and I said, you can do this. You lived in a, you lived in this laboratory 
for God knows how many years and God knows what happened to you. Anything after that, it's easy, right? And so that's that's an obstacle for many people and many dogs, I find, is that they'll they'll say, no, they, my dog can't do that. No, no. Or they'll say, I can't, I'm shocked. I can't believe they did that. And I think, why are you shocked? You should just, you really just go into this and say, I know, I believe in my dog. And I also believe in myself that I can help my dog through X, Y, and Z. I agree. There's an energy when you have confidence in yourself and what you believe the outcome can be for your dog. Instead of bringing a victim mentality to your dog's past situation, in this case, a terrible life in a laboratory. If you keep focusing on that past, that energy from the past, feelings like fear and lack of confidence, and like you said, oh, he can't do that because of everything he went through, that energy is different than, here's your new life, you're loved, you're safe, and we're going to give this a shot, and I believe you're going to do great. It's like an energy within yourself, and it's hard to describe what energy is, but dogs can pick up on that. Isn't that right? Oh, absolutely. A thousand, a thousand percent. And I've seen the shift. I've seen it with clients that they're very doubtful. They're very pessimistic. Uh, they're very cynical. They'll say to me, why is my dog doing it for you? Whatever it is. Or why is my dog not doing X, Y, and Z around you? But they do that with me. And I, I always give them the same answer. You know, I don't have any magic tricks up my sleeve. Um, it's, I believe in their dog. I have full confidence in the dog that the dog is going to do whatever situation we're putting them in or we're asking of them. But there are two camps and I, I see it again. I know this, this podcast is geared around laboratory research dogs, retired ones, but this goes for, for most people and that have dogs but particularly for retired laboratory research dogs, there's two camps. There's the, the people that suppress dogs and they isolate them. And then there are the other people that overindulge and overstimulate the dogs. You know, there are people that they adopt the dogs wherever the dogs are from and they're at a baseball game the next day. You, you can't do that. It's too much. You have to always be putting yourself in the dog's position. And then there are the other people that say, oh, no, my dog, we never leave the house. The dog never leaves the house. Well, that that's essentially just a large cage then for the dog if your dog is never leaving the house. But what's comfortable for your dog is what you have to do. And you ha again, it goes back to connecting with your dog. And, and even as silly as it might sound, just asking your dog, what do you need? What do you need? And that evolves with time. That changes. An important point is having realistic expectations when working with former research dogs. When we adopt a dog, we may imagine this dog being so happy to finally have a home, wagging his or her tail, looking joyfully at us. However, many laboratory dogs have had such a horrible, painful experience with humans or perhaps just very limited human interaction, that they are the opposite of joyful and happy. Some dogs may be totally terrified of their owners, which is how my beagle Marty was when we first adopted him, or shut down for a period of time, and this can be very discouraging. We may underestimate the amount of time it takes for a dog to overcome severe trauma or a negative association with people. So what specific methods would you use for a dog that fits this description? Um, well, if I can just back up a sec, these dogs, these laboratory research dogs, um, and every lab is different, right? There's different classes of labs. There's an A-class lab, which is very benign uh, testing, and then B and C and D and, and so on and so forth. And the higher down in the alphabet you go, the more invasive and uh, the tests are and borderline cruel and just uh, torturous for, for lack of a better words. But these dogs emotionally, behaviorally, and physically, everything, their overall health, their mind, their body, their spirit, it's all amplified. And one of the biggest overlooked training tools, if, 
if we're going to, if we're going to look at this from a training perspective is distance and time. And I think humans are just inherently, we're, I don't know why we're just all in a rush to do everything. And when you slow down and you just, a, a lot of this is observation, right? You just sit and observe your dog. And I think of it in terms of threes. There's, there's three days, the three days after you adopt a dog, there's three weeks and there's three months. Now within that, the minimum amount of time for transition or acclimation when you bring a dog into your home is nine months. You want to embrace everything that your dog is. You want to embrace all the, all the different traits that your dog has and, and work with and work out from there. So these expectations that, that a lot of people impose on dogs, all that's doing, it's counterproductive. It's, it's creating more stress on the dogs and then the dogs are getting stressed. And then that is going, it, it has this vicious cycle and it's this terrible feedback loop of then it makes the people stressed and annoyed. And then the dog feed, feeds off of that energy and then the dog gets more stressed. So knowing that everything is amplified with them, you're just going to give them the gift of, okay, I'm going to take this slowly. And I'm also going to just give them the time that they need. It might mean instead of you putting the grocery bag right in your kitchen, when you come in on the floor, that might scare your dog. Maybe you leave it down the hall and then you just, you do a, a breadcrumb trail of food, real food. I'm not talking about dog treats, but real food. A great tip is when you, when you bring a dog into your house, before you get that dog, go to the, go to the market and get a rotisserie chicken and dismantle that baby <laughs> until there is nothing left and put it into a million different, however you want it, Ziploc bags, Pyrex box containers, whatever. And that is your go-to every day. And it's all about desensitization, desensitization to things in your house and desensitization to things outside of your house. So the expectations, if you can keep them in check, it makes it easier for the dog to learn and to come out of their shell. A common scenario with newly adopted research dogs is that the dogs might warm up to the female in the household right away or soon after adoption, but they remain fearful of the males in the household for a longer period of time. And I've always thought, well, maybe it was that more men worked in the research laboratory and handled the dog. But what do you think this is about and what approaches would you use to help a dog in this situation? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've thought about that too, Ellie. I, I, I do think, you know, perhaps most, most of the researchers are men, but I, I don't know. I mean, we'll really never know that. But just in general, dogs are more apprehensive around men. And it's not that men are bad and women are good. It, it has nothing to do with that. It's that men have a different body language. It's much more intimidating. They're generally bigger. Men have a different vocal intonation. So you, you combine all of that and you put it all together in a package. And again, it goes back to these animals, these particular animals from a laboratory, everything, they're hypersensitive. If they're scared of a man and normally someone would think, well, maybe the, the man should be feeding the dog. Well, maybe, but maybe not because if a dog, let's just say a dog is eating two meals a day and a dog is terrified of the man in the house, that's going to make that meal extremely, extremely difficult for that dog, which is not, you're not, you're not really getting anywhere. So you, you want to keep in mind, like, how can I look at things from my dog's perspective? And so if we're looking at it in this particular case, as dogs are fearful of men, you want to dismantle it. And it's almost, it's almost, you're almost looking at it as, a, you know, you're building like a, like a house of cards, but, or, or a Lego set even better, which is isolate different things and use high value food. I'm not a fan of dog treats because 
they're generally not healthy. And a lot of people say, oh, well, I don't give my dog people food. I just want to clarify something. There's no such thing as people food. It's food. It's there, There's food on this planet and the food is meant for living beings, right? So you're not going to harm your dog if you give them people food. Now, you don't want to be feeding your dog from the kitchen table because then you're you're actually teaching them perhaps to beg from the table. But when it comes to behavior modification and trying to desensitize a dog to something that they're either terrified of or not comfortable with or anywhere in between, you need to find something that is motivating to them and that you can do the desensitization with. And generally, the best bang for your buck that makes the learning process easy is, is high value food. And that might be the chicken, or it might be um, a couple of pieces of steak, or it might be, I use a lot of goat cheese. So there's, there's, you have to see what, what your dog likes. And then you would just take the, the, the gentleman would take the food and even putting it in his hand, that might be too much for that dog to take at that time. But I mentioned the breadcrumb trail before with the dog food, or excuse me, with the grocery food bag. Uh, You could just have, you know, like a 10 foot breadcrumb trail of real food that lead up or around the guy and just keep it at that so that the dog just gets familiar with, oh, all right, you know what? Every time I'm around this person, all of these good things happen. It's almost like you know, he could, the, the guy could even be, the, the gentleman could even be walking around the house dropping little bits and pieces of food so that it's kind of like, you know, oh, wow, all these goodies are raining from the sky whenever he's around. Depending on the severity of the fear of the, of the gentleman, if the dog is, is that scared, reaching and petting and all of that needs to take a back seat. And you have to just wait until the dog is comfortable enough for that. It's better for a dog to come up to a person than a person to go up to a dog. Always remember that because they, if they're coming up to you, then they're, they're willing and able and they're, they're in, in a better mindset to accept it. The other things that a man can do though, is just from an optics point of view, standing straight on and facing a dog is really intimidating, particularly if they're staring or looking at a dog. So if, the dog is is terrified or uncomfortable the the gentleman should stand sideways because no matter how no matter how thin we are we're that much thinner generally and less intimidating looking if we stand sideways so that's always a great tip that that that's helpful the other thing is they could squat down down to the ground averting eye contact because Again, eye contact can be intimidating. So that's something else that they can do. But really, really being open to using high value food, you'd be surprised how rapid the training and the learning is with that. Dogs used for research have never really known love and kindness. They have often been abused and neglected. They are forced to obey and not fight against the procedures that they must endure. They live in cages, in basements, under fluorescent lights, a life that is so unnatural for a dog. So it's not surprising that many dogs rescued from research have what I will call a broken spirit. Can a dog's spirit be healed? And how would you define a dog's spirit? So yes, I do. I'm, I'm an optimist. So I believe that a dog's spirit can be healed at least to a degree. My interpretation and my um, definition of a a spirit, it's really, it's a constellation of energy. We're we're all a constellation of energies. And that that goes back to the, when I was mentioning quantum physics, that that's really what it is. It's that's this, it's the study of energy, but the body houses the spirit. And so that's why in my work, I'm always, I'm always blending the three, the mind, the body, and the spirit, because so often they're, you know, they're not, while they're interdependent, they're all, they have to have the synergistic relationship. So if the body is broken or diseased, the mind cannot be fully at peace. 
where the spirit cannot be fully at ease and vice versa, right? If the, the body has so much trauma, excuse me, the mind has so much trauma or anxiety that has a, a direct impact on the body and you're going to see inflammation, you're going to see chronic disease, et cetera, et cetera. So to, to say, okay, I'm only going to feed my dog healthy food, but then you don't address the dog's emotional state. It's really doing them a disservice. So, um, trying to make sure that you're always touching upon and balancing the three, it can seem like a juggling act and it is a juggling act, but it's a juggling act for, for anybody, but their spirits can be healed. I've seen it. I've seen them transform themselves over and over again. And we're what they need because they don't have a voice. We are who they need to help them, to help facilitate things, whether it's finding a playmate for them um, when you're at the park or um, having them exposed to different people of all different, you know, ages and different locations and bringing them to different places. I know one of the things, one of Sammy's favorite things to do was when I was saying they have a purpose, give them a sense of purpose was he loved car rides. Now, not every dog likes the car, but he loved to be in the car. So for him, that was a healing part of, of, of his spirit. I believe that there is an energy in what we put into our bodies. So that is the energy of food. In healing the research dog's body, nutrition plays an instrumental part. Dogs in research laboratories are fed a food called lab chow that is low quality and designed to make the dogs produce less waste and many lab dogs have rotted teeth as a result when they're rescued, which is one sign of poor diet. What are some things a research dog adopter can do to start healing the dog's body? And how does wholesome nutrition facilitate healing of the mind and spirit as well? Yes, yeah, I completely concur. There's quite a few things that adopters can do to help their dog's body heal and then in turn help the um, the mind heal and the spirit. But then there's also this conundrum that I believe, and I see what happens with, with every person that even if they get a dog from a breeder, they, they get so overwhelmed or they just kind of, I call it kitchen sinking the dog. They just throw everything that they've heard and, and, and possibly wanted to try at the dog all at once. And, um, that generally doesn't really work out too well for the dog because their digestive tract is, is really sensitive. They're already in a stressful situation from going from wherever they were to the new home. So because the gut houses the digestive tract, the, um, the gut houses at least 80% of the immune system, that's where I start. There's a lot of data out there, a lot of empirical evidence out there about, it's called the gut-brain axis. And there's this connection between the microbiome that's in the gut. And if it's, if there's a dysbiosis, or in other words, if there's, if it's just not healthy because there's been an onslaught of vaccines, an onslaught of medication, um, subpar food, stress, right? All of those bad conditions they build up. And over a very short period of time, what it does is it weakens the junctures inside the dog's gut or, or in, it, this happens to any, any animal, you know, including us. I see a lot of people with leaky gut too. And then the particles um, that should be contained within the gut, they start to seep into the bloodstream and that's where you get inflammation and you get then allergies or sensitivities or intolerances and then chronic disease. And dogs are probably coming into people's homes on a bag of kibble. And so how I look at it as rather than just swapping out the kibble immediately on day one with a healthy food, first transition your dog and use a bone broth to just pour over, warm it up. It doesn't have to be boiled, just warm it up and drizzle that over the dog's food. And that even, even the, the fact that it's warmed up, you're replenishing a dog's entire body system and all of their organs with some, some warm 
nourishing food. And bone broth has a lot of beneficial properties to it. I actually have a bone broth recipe. That's my favorite on my website if you want to direct your listeners to that. But bone broth, it's really going to help seal those junctures and there's collagen in it and it's going to help support the gut. So that's that's the easiest and one of the best things to just start with. After that, then I go with a digestive enzyme and a pre-probiotic. And I, I have, again, I have this on my website, but that's just a, a simple powder that you can add to their food, whatever their food might be. The other thing I do is, you know, there's their immune system is more than likely weakened with everything that they've been through and what their body has dealt with. And so I like to add colostrum into their, into their food. And I just do that for a good, a good month after that, then I will start to reanalyze, okay, what exactly does this dog need? And every single dog doesn't matter where they come from. They do need a detox and it should be a liver detox. It could be a heavy metal detox. How do you do that? There's, there are a variety of different supplements out there, but again, you don't want to over supplement, but then you also don't want to destroy the two main happiest parts of their day, which are their meals, right? So if you take, a, you could take the greatest meal, you could take um, organic raw food. And if you dump a bunch of supplements on there, you've just, you've just ruined the best part of their day. So if you're going to supplement, which I do encourage you to do it, but just keep it to a minimum and keep it specific to your dog. You could even make like a little cocktail up of taking two or three of the supplements and blending it in with the bone broth and then drizzling it over the food. That way it's kind of surreptitiously inserted into their, maybe not their meal, but as a snack in the middle of the day or, or after they eat. So their, their actual dinner or breakfast is not, is not um, altered. People who adopt research dogs describe this experience as life-changing. As their dog slowly becomes a part of their family and the outside world, every small accomplishment or brave new step the dog makes is the best feeling in the world. There is no greater joy in that moment. I know this because I've been there with my own research dogs. Can you share why you think these moments are so special with laboratory dogs, and how have your laboratory dogs changed your own life? Yeah, I I love your question because I don't know if everyone does this, but I I'm always thinking, why are my animals in my life? What lessons are they here for me to learn? You know, because I I do truly believe that they're here as a, a, a spirit, a guide to teach us many things, not just not just one thing. I believe, you know, these, because these dogs were just looked at as a number, I think the greatest lesson that they've, they've all given me, but especially my laboratory dogs is there's nothing you can't overcome. And you really have to be optimistic in life to get the most out of life. Because once there's that pessimism or that cynical thread that can seep into anybody's life or their mind, then it shuts off all these other opportunities. And, and I think about Sammy in particular, it ended up being a running joke because people would say to me, there's no way that this dog was a laboratory research dog. He is insanely social and happy-go-lucky and he didn't have any so-called scars from where he came from, right? But it took a lot of work on his part. And that goes for anybody. Finn too, and all, and Marty, and all of these dogs. It doesn't just happen. We have, to, we have to put ourselves out there to help them put themselves out there. But I mean, I think the lesson to answer your question that they've given is you just always you always keep going and you never, ever give up. And you just keep believing that there's a lot of good out there. So I'm on this new mission and I've, I've labeled it the art of living with the dog. And I, I started 
thinking about this, um, I guess it was a culmination of just 30 years of people coming to me saying, I need your help. I want my dog to stop doing this and I need my dog to do that. And I, I had an epiphany that is, you know, it's not about teaching your dog to sit and lie down and to stay and to be statuesque because it's just not real life. I mean, none of my dogs are like that. I just want my dogs to, you know, I don't want them to go into the garbage and I want to make sure that if they have a, a bone or a chew that I can, you know, nicely, they'll, they'll relinquish it and I'll take it. I want to know that they know how to go into a car and they know what to do and what to expect and not be stressed at a vet. So teaching these research laboratory dogs just life skills and giving them a skill set to work from that again, it, it reduces their anxiety and it, it embellishes everyday routines. So if you can get them again, it, it goes back to desensitization, pairing everything with high value food. If you just think about, okay, what are the things that go on in my dog's life on a day-to-day -day basis or on a yearly basis it would generally be, you know, teaching them to relinquish something that they might have. So that would be doing an exchange with another high value food. Uh, it would be teaching them what to expect in a car. You could maybe even feed them dinner in the car so that they associate the car with something good or give them treats in a car. Um, it, you want to make sure your dog knows how to get to know, knows what to expect at the vet when, and not, and not the day that they have to go to the vet for something so pop your dog in the car or walk to the vet and get to the, get to the veterinarian and don't go in, but just have a, a little bag of that rotisserie chicken and hang out in the parking lot for five minutes. And then the following week, go back and then just walk into the, the waiting room and give your dog some chicken and then have the vet tech give the dog chicken. And, and, you know, you just do those types of things to help your dog get really acclimated to everyday occurrences so that they have the ability to just flow through life without being stressed and they can feel confident and happy because we want our dogs to be happy. I think that it's really easy to be distracted nowadays to say, well, my, my dog's on the best food and I have this great trainer and they do tricks and they do agility. But the question is, is, but is your dog happy? You keep mentioning a dog's happiness. How do you know if your dog is happy? I think you can tell, you know, I know if I look at a dog, I can tell if that dog's happy or not. Their, their body is relaxed. Um, and, and every dog demonstrates happiness in a different way, but I can surely tell just like I can tell from a person, if they seem that they're really tense and uptight, I don't think they're really too happy. One of the other things, and this sounds really corny, but I, I love what it does. I actually have a foster dog right now that you hear hacking <laughs> in the background. And one thing that I do with every single dog that's in my house or my client's dogs is I find a, a, a tune, a music, a song that I absolutely love. And I just, I, I won't blast it, but I'll put it up. And I'll dance and I, I don't dance, dance like a maniac in, to the, to the point of scaring a dog. But what that does is that is another oxytocin burst and it relaxes the dogs all the time. They, they look at me and they say, Oh, she, she's, she's happy. She's giddy. My gosh, what's going on? I'm going to run around. I'm going to chase her. And, you know, as adults, I think far too often we don't get on the floor. We don't play with dogs like kids do. Men are great at that. Men, they get on the ground, they get down and dirty with the dogs. But a lot of times women, we just, I don't know, we just don't do it. So try to get on the floor, play with your dog. And, and the last thing I just want to say is don't ever underestimate the power of a smile because a dog knows that a smile is a good thing and a positive thing. And it, it really, it makes their heart happy. I, I know when I smile at a dog, I can see them relax. And my hope is that if that's the one thing that you try to do, that you'll be making your dog happy. 
I dance with my dogs. I know the positive aspects of doing that. So I'm not shy to tell the world about that. <laughs> okay, good. Th that, that'll be a video maybe one time between you and me. <laughs> yeah, maybe it will. Thanks for listening to Dog Research Exposed. Check out our website at www.dogresearchexposed.com for more resources and actions you can take to help dogs in research laboratories today.